Hello, I'm Jordi Bailina. I'm the technical lead at Polygon uh, ZKVM. And in today's lecture, I'm going to explain a little bit how uh, ZK Rollups works. And uh, we are going to explain also how the, the ZK proof is generated in the ZK Rollups. This is the core piece and the most differential piece uh, that's in the ZK Rollups. So let's uh, start first how, uh, in a brief introduction in how a rollup uh, works. A rollup is like some, a blockchain, so it's like any other blockchain and has the same properties as the blockchain, but without the consensus uh, layer. In general, we are uh, leveraging this consensus layer on top of another uh, layer one, most of the cases, uh, Ethereum. Okay, so a rollup you can understand um, it's a it's a chain that has a state um, uh, represented by a state root. In this state, you can have the balances of the account, you can have the smart contracts, the storage of those smart contracts, and uh, once in a while, we uh, collect um, a set of transactions and we process these transactions. So we go from one state, we process these transactions deterministically, and we go to the next state. This, um, so this is how, how, how it works. And this happens was once. So we are generating these blocks, or if in, in layer twos, we call them batches to distinguish from the layer one uh, blocks. Okay. So let's see how a real ZK uh, EVM works in the case of the Polygon ZK EVM works. Um, so if you are a user and you want to send uh, transactions to the blockchain, what you are going to do instead of uh, broadcasting that in a peer-to-peer -peer network, what you're going to do is you're going to send that to a sequencer. If the sequencer is uh, centralized, that means that you are going to send these transactions directly to the sequencer. The sequencer will include these transactions in one of the blocks. It's going to generate blocks in generally real quite quite fast, uh, and 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 then. Uh, once uh, the sequencer decides that your transaction is inside, it's going to return you the new block with your transaction, and then you will have what we call it a trusted state. Um, this is uh, because this is centralized. This, I mean, the, you need to trust the you need to trust the sequencer. Okay, so uh, because the sequencer they can do other things. So, but if you trust the sequencer, this transaction you can consider that's uh, that's uh, final. Okay. Then this sequencer, once in a while, in general, when uh, a full batch, so when a, when, when a full, um, when, a, when it has a lot of transactions, or after a timeout, if there is not many transactions in the in the rollup, then it sends these uh, transactions on chain. So they put these transactions in a call data in a normal Ethereum transaction, and then these transactions are sent on chain. At this point, the transactions are final and trustless, so nobody can modify these transactions. Everybody knows what transactions are going to be executed. And you can compute the new state, so anybody can compute this new state because they have these transactions, these transactions execute deterministically on top of the previous, uh, um, on top of the previous batch, and so anybody can know, knows what's the new state. But the blockchain does not know uh, this state. So in this state, you know for sure that your transaction is going to be executed, in, and you know for sure what's going to be the new state, but the only thing that you cannot do is withdraw funds, because the, in order to withdraw funds, the blockchain needs to know what's this state. I mean, you need to know if you make a transaction for exit, for example, and recovering, but um, in this case, the... the, the uh, the blockchain, the layer one, does not process uh, all these transactions. Actually, processing these transactions in a naive way, just in solidity, would be really expensive and not viable. So, what we do in order to consolidate this state, or in order to create this trustless this explicit state and put this state on chain, here there is two techniques. The optimistic uh, rollups, what they do is they just put this, uh, somebody puts this. Uh, uh, this state, and then there is a challenging period because this state can be uh, bad, and then it is a challenging period where you can decide that this state uh, is uh, good or bad. In general, this challenging period is about uh, one week. Okay, or what you can do, and this is what the zk rollups do, is just put a validity proof that 
this state is correct. So it's a validity proof that proves that the execution of these transactions on top of this uh, block is exactly this uh, uh, state root. And this can be done really, really fast. Uh, you, you can compute one of these proofs in uh, minutes, and then you just uh, uh, and then when this is um, when this proof is verified uh, on chain, then you can you are able to um, uh, withdraw the funds or maybe move the funds to other rollups or just uh, leave the the, the rollup. Okay. So you see that the core piece is this prover. You know, this prover is um, this proof. You need to prove what you need to prove here. So this proof is you. You have a, uh, a, a current state, the of the state root. You have a set of transactions that you want to process, and you want to compute the, uh, deterministically this new state root. So you want to prove that uh, these transactions goes to the this new state root. And so the circuit is something that's taking transactions and uh, executing those transactions. In the case of a ZKVM, these transactions are, uh, these transactions are mm, normal Ethereum transactions. Can be normal transfers, can be normal, uh, can be deploying a smart contract, can be executing a, a function in the smart contract, and they need to behave, the behavior should be exactly the same that what Ethereum does. If it's executing a smart contract and this, is, this is smart contract has some opcodes, you need to execute the opcodes the same way that Ethereum does. That's what a ZKBM uh, means. That's uh, acting exactly uh, the same way that uh, uh, Ethereum, Ethereum does. So how we build this uh, proof? If we try to build this proof in a naive way, for example, we try to build that in, in, in Circom, a naive way would be, okay, let's put uh, for, imagine that, the, the, imagine take just the part, for example, of executing some opcode, then you would put all the opcodes in, 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 in parallel, and you would have to repeat uh, all the opcodes every time, so for every every time that you execute one of the opcodes. So as you can see, uh, each opcode can be really big. Imagine a Ketchak uh, opcode, okay? And if you want to repeat that many times, uh, then this would be like uh, uh, impossible, um, by, uh, not, not, not possible. The number of constraints that you would need if you trying to build that in Circon would be um, thousands of trillions. So it would be really, really impossible. So here the trick is um, mainly working with uh, polynomials. The cool thing of uh, generating um, validity proof with polynomials or zero knowledge proof with polynomials is that polynomials allows us to prove many constraints at a time. So a polynomial constraint, actually you can understand a polynomial as a set of values and this polynomial, if this polynomial is of degree um, to the 23, that means that you have 8 million values, okay? And then uh, a constraint, for example, a polynomial A times polynomial B is equal to polynomial C, that would be a, a constraint that you can add. Uh, with a single constraint, actually you are uh, proving uh, 8 million constraints uh, at a time. Okay? So that's why this uh, working with polynomials is really interesting because uh, allows us to do uh, millions of constraints in, in, in parallel, okay? And um, so, and in, in order to do that, and this is the, 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 you know, the, the main strategy that we are following here, is the idea is um, with these uh, polynomial constraints, uh, this allows, uh, uh, the poly with the polynomial constraints allows us to build uh, state machines because you can put constraints of uh, if we understand that polynomials are uh, columns and uh, each of the evaluation, each of the values are, are, are rows, the idea is that you can define um, a relationship between each rows. So and if you can define this relationship between each rows, then you can uh, create the state machines. If you can create the state machines, that means that you can create a processor. And then uh, if you create a processor, you can create a program that's running on top of this processor. And if this program is emulating the EBM, then you will have a proof that actually uh, is proving the EBM execution. So this is the main, the main strategy that we are following to build uh, the ZK EBM. Let's uh, start to deep in um, how this proof is generated. And let's uh, start by the bottom layer, 
with, we call it the hardware layer because the one is most in the bottom, and it's how we build these uh, circuits with uh, polynomials, how we define these uh, polynomial uh, constraints or polynomial identities uh, in order to build uh, uh, a circuit. Um, to, to work in this layer, we created a language named uh, Polynomial Identity Language that will help us to write these, uh, to write these uh, circuits. So in order to see what we can do with, with language, let's start with a simple example. This would be the hello world of this example. That's the, uh, that, that, that's the Fibonacci series. So in this case, the, so let's define the, the, the problem. The problem is imagine that you have a, a, a number in, so you want to prove that if you have a, a, a number in a, in a specific prime field, uh, I want to prove that I know uh, two numbers that when I two numbers that when I apply the Fibonacci series for let's say uh, 1,024 times, then uh, uh, I get to this number. Okay, that would be uh, an example. If you want to write that in in, in circum in normal, then that would be relatively easy, it's just a normal loop of uh, 1024, and then we just define that these 1024 constraints, one for each step on the series, okay? But we want to do that in, 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 in parallel, okay? We want to do that in, in, uh, with polynomials, okay? So here the strategy is that what we're gonna have is in, we are gonna define two committed polynomials, in this case is uh, A before last polynomial, and A uh, uh, last uh, polynomial, and uh, these polynomials are going to be of degree uh, 1024, okay? And uh, we want to define um, a relationship, a polynomial relationship uh, that follows this Fibonacci series, okay? So the, the relationship that we want to, uh, to, to express is, 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 is this one, okay? So the idea is that we want to see that, for example, that a, la a before last is a, a last, okay? And then we want to uh, so uh, so, uh, and then we want to define that the a last on the next line is going to be the a before last and a last in the previous line. So we define here with with sorry we, we define this with these polynomials identities here. The wx here sorry the wx here means the the next the next row. Okay, so here what it's saying is that a before last of the next row is a last of the current row, and a last of the next row is going to be a before last of the preview. Of, of a, so a last of the next row is going to be a before last uh, 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 plus a last of the current of the current row. Okay, so when if we want to define that in 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 peel, then uh, we we would do it uh, this way. Mainly we say here that the a before last minus so is equal to a last. Okay, and here we define that uh, a last is equal to a before last plus a last. Okay, the problem of doing this is that um, uh, the relationships of these polynomials we can define these polynomials between one value and the next value in uh, from one, one row and the next row. But the problem is that. Uh, this constraint must also fulfill when we go around. So when we go from the, 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 so the relationship between the last and the first, because this is a cyclic relationship, must also follow. And in this case, uh, if I am adding these two numbers, it's not gonna be, uh, if I'm adding these last two numbers, it's not gonna be one. So the idea is that I don't want to generate a constraint for the last line. So in order to do that, we define another polynomial, in this case is, is last. This polynomial is not generated uh, uh, every time, it's uh, we, we call it a, a pre-computed polynomial or a constant polynomial, so a polynomial that the prover and the verifier knows, so it's different, so it's the same for all the instances, okay? And it's gonna be a polynomial with, it's gonna be zero in all the rows, except in the last row that's gonna be one, okay? So, and, and, and then we modify the pill so that we say that um, a minus last, so you see that here if it's last is, is one, then uh, one minus one is zero, so zero for times whatever is gonna be zero, so no matter what, the relationship for the last row is gonna fulfill always, okay? But if it's last is zero, so for the remaining rows, then it's one minus zero is one, and then 
a before last minus a last uh, must fulfill. So a, a before last must be equal to a last. Okay, an a last um, and an, an a last uh, the next row must be equal to a before last plus a last of the current row. Okay, so with these two with these two constraints with these two constraints um, we define the polynomial. Here you see that, for example, we define well in this case we define the, the, the State machine or the namespace is Fibonacci is one to one thousand twenty four, and then is 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 I mean the, the is last is constant, and then we have the the in the last lines. Uh, mainly, what we do is we define a public uh, a public in this case a public output. This public output is um, the place where is this public output is in the a last in the in the last uh, in the last line of the a last uh, polynomial and then we need to also define this uh, what we call it the boundary constraint in this case is that in the is last so when is last is, is is one so in the last line a last must be equal to this uh, public so we need to add this 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 constraint okay so you see here it's important you see here why is important this example because you see here an example of defining uh, the concept of a state machine we have a some registers, okay, and then we define this transition state machine, this relationship between one state and the next state. Okay, so this is the idea of a state machines. And again, if we have a state machines, we can build uh, we can build processors. Okay, we can build processors, and then we can build a program that's running in top of this processor, so we can build whatever we want. Okay. Let's see other things that you can do in 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 PIL. Okay. Um, um, one thing that we can do in PIL is uh, mm, permutation checks. So one thing is imagine that we have two polynomials and we want to add some constraints. This is done uh, internally. We're following some some specific uh, um, arguments. Okay, but in this case, I want to prove that all the values in A are all the values in B, no matter the order. It's a permuta one is a permutation of the other. Of the other. Okay, so A is, is, is exactly the same that B, but in in, in any any random order. So, in PIL, we just define it very easily. We just say that a is a is b. Okay, this is how we would define that in PIL. Actually, in PIL, we can do it um, a little bit more complex. So, instead of working with one column, we can work with uh, with many columns. In this case, for example, a one and a two. Is in so the these two these two values of a one and a two have the these values in B1 and B2, okay, and I want and and I can have another polynomial that is a binary polynomial that we call it the selector, select in this case selector A and selector B, just to take in account the specific rows. So in this case we see that uh, the first row is one, so that means it's taking account, and this row must be in the in the in the in the cell B uh, B1 and B2, and we express that in PIL this way. So it's a selector A1 A2 is in is in selector is a selector uh, B1 and B2. Okay, this is just permutation permutation checks. I can do the same uh, with plucaps. The plucaps is, is not permutation, it's, uh, it's an inclusion. So that means that all the values in A must be included in the values in B. Okay, so this 3, 3 is here, the 6 is also here, uh, the 5 is also here, and the 1 is here. So this is the, 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 the inclusion. Okay, the, this is what's called a plucap. In PIL, we define that is A is in B. So instead of is, is in, in B. Okay, and we can also work with multiple columns and with uh, selectors. So the idea is that we can see that multiple columns are included. Uh, so these two columns are included in these two columns. Uh, so they are equal in these two columns, and there is an inclusion for just some specific, some specific, uh, some specific rows. And we express that exactly the same way. Cela a1, A2, in cell B, B1, B2. Again, plucap is a plucap argument. Internally, the prover is going to generate these plucap arguments that will force that this constraint is, 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 is valid. Okay? And in a, in a pill, we can have as many plucaps as we want or as many uh, um, permutation checks as we want. What else we can do in, uh, in pill? Well, we can put uh, connection checks or copy constraints, if you want. Imagine that you have a polynomial, and I want to um, uh, enforce that, uh, for example, the first value is equal to the third, uh, fourth, and fifth. So we have this a copy constraint, so we connect. It's like we, we have a connection. We connect uh, uh, one value with uh, another value. Or in this case, for example, I want to force that the second value is equal to the 
seventh value. So what we do is we take what we call it a, a, an identity uh, polynomial. In this case, is x. Okay, and this is the polynomial where where you know we start normally. And then for each connection, what we do is uh, uh, permutation. We create a rotation uh, on, of this polynomial. So for example, uh, the 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 one. So here is the the one, the three, four, um, and five. So I want to connect. So what I'm doing is I'm just rotating. The one is putting here. The three is going to the next. The four is going to the next, and the fifth is going to the first. So I ju I create another polynomial where the the, the evaluations are. Um, um, permutated, okay, and putting cycles for all the values that I want to connect. Okay, If I don't want to connect one of the values, I just keep the same, okay? If I want to connect two values, I just swap one of the other. But if I connect three values, I just create a rotation on there, okay? So here is, this would be the, this S polynomial that defines the, these um, connections, so how does it be, be connected? And then in PIL, we just say that A connects uh, uh, with S. In general, S is going to be a, a constant polynomial. It does not necessarily be, but uh, in general, you, you want to define the connections as part of the circuit. Okay, and we can do that in not for a single column. We can have like different polynomials and connect them between polynomials. So I can connect have one value in C and connect with uh, some values in A, B, C. Okay, and we do that also the same way. We define uh, three polynomials. In this case, it is an identity constant times identity and another constant time identity and then I just permutate these three polynomials in the in the way that I just do the connections okay and, and I express that in peel this way okay so I just that a, a 1 a 2 a 3 connects with s1 s2 and, and uh, uh, s3 okay so with all this tooling for example what I can do is I can create plonk for example plonk is an is a, a concrete case of uh, so I can I can implement peel, uh, plonk in pill okay so um, if you know how plonk works if we have uh, the three committed polynomials a b c here we have the uh, sorry here we have the um, here we have the the, um, the 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 plonk gate okay the q left times a plus q r times v plus q output times c plus q q m times a times v plus qc equals zero, okay? Here we have the connection part of the polynomial, so we define the three polynomials that connects one of the other, and in this case, we also define a public input. In this case, the public input is in A0, and we put the boundary constraint here. We say that L1, which is, is the, it's a polynomial that just one at the first value and zero in the remaining, so first Lagrange polynomial, and then uh, just say that A minus public input is equal to zero. So this is the define a, a public input in this. Uh, but this here you see that how easy is to uh, generate Plonk uh, in, in, in PIL. Now that we have um, the tooling for building these basic polynomial circuits, or if you want this arithmetization layer, let's try to build something uh, more complex or something more interesting or something that's going to be the base for the ZKVM prover. Let's try to build a processor. Let's see how a processor would look like. Imagine that we want to define a processor with five uh, generic registers, A, B, C, D, and E. And let's um, start with uh, basic operations. Imagine a processor that just, that the only thing you want to do is do moves. So you want to move the value that's in A that goes to B, or another instruction that could be moved from C D. Okay, so um, in this processor we will define uh, some polynomials um, that will be the the instructions. Okay, so an instruction it is going to be a set of uh, polynomials. In this case, in A, in B, in C, in D, in E, in E, and set A, set B, set C, set D, and set E. So instruction will be a combination of uh, any of these polynomials that are binary. And in general, only one in A is going to be one, and only one set B is going to be, uh, or one set, whatever, is going to be one. Okay, So this is going to be the instruction. So in these polynomials, we will see the instruction that we are uh, executing. 
Okay, and imagine that we want to do a movement between uh, a move of the of the moving the value from A to B. Then c in A is going to be one, set B is going to be uh, one, and the other polynomials are going to be zero. Okay, this is going to be instruction. That's a move from A uh, to B. Okay, if we see how this would be written in polynomials, we see here down the 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 pill that would be equivalent to that. For that, we define uh, intermediate polynomials. Just note here that the OP is not a committed, it's just uh, an intermediate polynomial that's defined at A times in A, B times in B, C times in B, D times in D, and E times in E. If in A is one, then OP is gonna be one. Okay, if in B is one and the others are zero, then OP is gonna be B. So the in indicates which, um, which register are you putting in the op, uh, in the register B, okay? And then we define the condition for what's the next value for the register A. Well, if set A is uh, one, then oh, in, in 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 this second in this in this second um, uh, constraint, we see that. Uh, O uh, set A is going to be one, so OP minu minus A plus A, A cancels, and A, A prime is going to be OP. Okay. If in, instead set A is zero, then A prime is A. So we'll keep the the value. So for the set set whatever that are zero, we are going to keep the value. And if uh, and for set uh, whatever is one, then we are going to insert the value of OP. So. If you see that clearly that if the instruction in the instruction in A is one and set B is one and the remaining polynomials are zero, we will have a move between A and B. And with this, we can solve any of the of the movements. Okay. Um, if you want to, for example, create a, an instruction that's um, an immediate value, that means you want to put, for example, a four in the instruction, then here we have another polynomial that's part of the instruction that's going to be a constant. So the instruction can contain uh, uh, a constant. In general, constant is going to be zero, but if constant is uh, five, and then all in in A, in B, in C, and D, in E is zero, then uh, in OP is going to be this constant, and then I can set to any of the, of the registers. Okay. Note here that in a processor, um, it's convenient to have also not a register, but a, a bit on instruction we call it in free. In. So this allows us, this allow uh, to the, you can have instructions where you can put any value to uh, any register. In general, you want to do that when the next instruction is gonna check that what you put in this register is correct. For example, if you want to do uh, a square root, of a polynomial, uh, what you will do is, okay, you put the result of the square root, then you multiply this, the, this result by itself and then check that's the original instead of computing the square root, okay? This non-deterministic way of writing programs in general is written that way. So we have a processor, we can move things and we can, um, well, we have immediate values and some instructions we allow us to, to uh, any value, okay? But uh, next thing that you, in general, you want to add to processors is um, is uh, conditional. Sometimes you want to have a, a program that, okay, say if, if, if some value is zero, for example, just jump here, if not, continue the normal, ex the normal execution. So to do that, uh, well, we need to implement in polynomials uh, 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 a zero detector, so some, some, some way that algebraically you detect the E0, you can see here. I'm not gonna take the detail, but you can, you can check how it works. And the idea is that the processor is gonna have a program counter. A program counter register is a, a register that points to the, some position in the program or in the ROM that uh, is the one that's uh, executing one, okay? So when there is a condition, mainly what we do is we change this uh, uh, program counter. This program counter, if you want to jump, 
uh, the idea is to put this, uh, this new address, but if we want to continue for normal instructions, we are going to just increment uh, this uh, program counter. So the next instruction is gonna be the next instruction. This is very much like a normal processor works. Uh, all the processors have this program counter that uh, points to the, the, to the program. But you see here, so we can we have conditions, we have, uh, uh, so we can do jumps, conditional jumps, we can do uh, movements, okay, but you see that um, these instructions are in some polynomials, but uh, what is the ROM? What, what is the program that's executing? Actually, in, this, in these uh, instructions are committed polynomials, and in these instructions I can put whatever instruction I want. So uh, I can decide to put, uh, so I can, I can decide, uh, so it's not constrained to any program. I can put any uh, instructions that I want in each, in each, in each row. So how do I, do I force to execute a program? So in order to do that, we just create a, a ROM. A ROM is um, uh, uh, a set of lines, and in each line, uh, an instruction. As I told you, uh, an instruction can be many polynomials, in general, many polynomials. And you see here that uh, this, these are constant polynomials. So we have one, one, one polynomial that's going to be the row, the, the line num the, the row number, the, the, so the program line, OK? And then we will have a, a set of uh, a set of polynomials. In this case, I say instruction, but this is a set of polynomials that here is where uh, can be uh, the program that you want to execute. And these are constant polynomials. Are polynomials that are known by the prover and the verifier. So the you know that this processor is going to execute a specific uh, ROM. Okay. And uh, in the left side, I have the polynomials that we have seen until, until now. So we have uh, the program counter. This is the program counter register. And here is the instruction that I'm, that I'm executing. So this is a committed polynomial that uh, it's saying which instruction uh, is executed. So here, what, what I do is I'm saying with a plug up that the instruction that I'm executing is, um, is in the ROM. That means that, uh, for example, if I make sure if, if the program counter says five, then uh, because there is only one line five in the ROM, that means that um, in order to uh, fulfill that the, uh, this uh, plug up, the instruction that I need to put here, that I need to put here, is exactly, so must be the one that's in the ROM. And with this, I'm forcing that I'm executing the right uh, yeah, specific program. Okay, so you see here that I can define a ROM. A ROM at the end is compiled to a constant a set of constant polynomials. Okay, and then in the processor, I am executing this, this ROM. And I can do, in this case, can do movements and, and, and jumps. Okay, but in general, well, we, you, can, you can also have a memory. In order, I'm not going to enter to the detail, but the idea is that you can have an instruction that can be a read-write memory, and then I can have another state machine that's the memory. And the idea is that, so that here the, the trick is in the in this other state machine, what I'm doing is I'm in, I'm uh, sorting the other um, instructions that I'm doing in the in the normal in the normal trace in the main, but I'm I'm sorting them by address. So I have I pack all the address and then by the the, the, the count. Uh, the, the Race number, okay. So that means that I'm packing all the reads and writes for a given instruction in the same place, so I can do it with a single register. And then I'm just doing a single uh, a single permutation check between the ROM and the, between the the main execution trace and the and the memory. Okay. So with this, I could have a processor with memory and with some instructions. Okay. In general, you will want also to do some arithmetic operations or some binary operations and some other more interesting operations. And here the idea is a little, it's, it's, it's quite easy. In general, it's always the same. We define um, a secondary state machine, in this case, an arithmetic state machine that's just doing uh, arithmetic operations. So and you are here is doing additions or multiplications or whatever arithmetic operation you want to do. And in the main, you when you are executing one arithmetic operation or when you want to check that two values fulfill an arithmetic operation, then the only thing is that you do is a plug up. You just say, you just do a matching uh, with, uh, so you just do a, a, an in that says, okay, the, the, 
the operation that I'm assuming in the main must be checked or must be included in this arithmetic state machine. If it's in the arithmetic state machine, that means that this operation, so in general, is the inputs and the outputs of this operation are correct, fulfills this uh, uh, arithmetic session, and then I'm just uh, checking that R in both, in, in, in both sides. Okay, so with this, I have a I have a pro, uh, have a full processor, and uh, um, well, I can do any operation, have memory, arithmetic operations, um, a program that's uh, running binary operations, and so on. So, what we did in order to build a processor to execute the EBM is create a processor that looks very much like that with uh, registers that are 256 bits, so they have different chunks and um, some details. We also have, for example, a storage um, state machine just to uh, store values to a sparse uh, Merkle, to a sparse Merkle tree. Uh, we have a binary, we have arithmetic, we have also hash uh, state machines where we compute hash. So the idea is that we built the the, all the hardware, all the arithmetization of all these state machines that are required in order to execute uh, the, uh, the EBM, uh, the, the, so the EBM ROM, the, 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 to emulate uh, the, the EBM. Okay, but this is the, the hardware, the hardware layer. Okay, and in top of this uh, processor actually is going to be the what we call it the ROM, so the real program. This program is written in an assembly. It's an assembly, specific assembly for this uh, processor. And this will, this ROM will emulate the, uh, it, it will emulate uh, Ethereum. So it will take um, uh, transactions. It will check that these transactions have the valid signature. Uh, it will discount uh, the gas, the ether, if it's a deployment smart contract, needs to deploy a smart contract. So this ROM actually is writing the same thing that a GAF in Ethereum is doing or that like, any client is doing. It's simulating Ethereum. So it has to do the things exactly the same way that Ethereum. Actually, we are even using the Ethereum test suite to test that this program is okay, that uh, um, that's behavior is exactly the same that the Ethereum that the Ethereum does. Okay. This is an example uh, of how this assembly would look like. Here, again, I don't want to enter in detail in this assembly, but uh, for example, this this dollar. When you see this dollar, these are free inputs. So these these are instructions that allow you to do a free uh, a free input. Okay. In the left and in the left, you see that. Um, uh, the ins, the selected registers that go to up, uh, in, in the right to the arrow is where and setting. So there's going to be a, a, a register or a set of registers. And after the column, here is the actual instructions. If it's an arithmetization, a jump, a conditional jump, or uh, whatever. Now that we have seen how to build a, a, a proof with uh, this pill, this um, assembly, and this program, okay. We, with this, we already have a, a proof. Actually, we have a huge start. It's a proof that if we see the, the if we see how this proof like, this, this will be the, the, the basic circuit, but it's gonna be a big proof. It's gonna be a proof, um, it's gonna be a start that will have more than 1,000 polynomials with a degree, we are working with a degree of two to the 23. It's, um, it's a proof that takes about two minutes to generate, but it's a big proof. It's a proof of about uh, uh, two megabytes of information. Okay, so what we want to do, if you want to verify this proof on chain, mainly what we want to do is we want to do two things. We want to compress this proof, so make a proof that's something that's uh, uh, smaller, and we want also to aggregate this proof. We also want to take uh, the proof of various blocks and convert to a single proof. We want to prove a segment uh, of, uh, of, the, of the rollup, of, of the chain, not a single, not a single block. So let's see how we compress these, these, these rules. The way to do is we apply recursion. What means recursion? Mainly what we do is we generate another circuit. In this case, we generate this circuit with Plonk that verifies the previous proof. So it's a circuit that it has the, the, the previous proof, the, the, so the current proof as a, public, as a public input. And uh, 
it verifies uh, this proof. This verifier is a Stark verifier. It's written in, in, in Plonk. Actually, it's using many uh, custom gates uh, of Plonk, so to, to reduce um, this, this, so to, to reduce the, this Stark as much as, as we can. And if we see the, if we see the statistics of this um, first uh, iteration, this first recursion, it's a much smaller Stark. It's a Stark that has only 65 uh, um, committed polynomials, and the degree of these polynomials is 2 to the, two to the 22. Okay? And the, the proof that we generate after this second stage of recursion is um, about um, 500 uh, um, kilobytes, so one-fourth of, of the previous proof. Okay? And this actually we could do it uh, uh, more times. Okay, actually if we do a, a third time, we can generate another circuit. In this case, it's called recursive two. That as an input, it takes uh, C twelve, so it, it takes the previous one, and again it verifies that again. Okay. In order to do the recursion, what we do is we do um, a, a trick. So we are taking this circuit. Okay, and. Uh, Instead of generating a full circuit that um, verifies the that verifies the previous one, actually what we are taking is okay. If you see this circuit, well, it's gonna have a, it's gonna be a plonk. It's gonna have some structure, but at some point it's gonna um, have hard coded the the root C. The root C is what represents the the, the circuit itself. The root C is where the, um, the queues and the, and the permutation checks of the plonk. Um, so the constant, the constant functions, the, 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 so the constant functions that define the circuit itself are, uh, are represented by a Merkle tree in a Stark, and, and, and the root of this Merkle tree is what represents the, the circuit. So what we're doing is we modify this circuit and take and we take this um, um, this constant uh, root uh, instead of hard coded inside the circuit, we just generate a template that has as an input this constant circuit. Okay, so this template is um, I can embed this template in any other circuit, and but the only condition is that the root C. If I want to verify the the previous, um, uh, if I want to verify the, the previous circuit, the, it, this root C must be the constant generated by the by the previous uh, uh, by, by the previous by the recursive one circuit. Okay, so I have a template that verifies a C12 uh, proof. Okay. Uh, if uh, this uh, input is uh, a specific value that represents this circuit, okay? So what we do with this template actually is I generate uh, another circuit using this template twice, okay? So what it does, the circuit is aggregate two proofs, okay? So maybe the proof of the batch 24 and the proof of the batch 25, okay? Uh, both proofs are, are part of the, of the input, and then this proof, this circuit verifies the two proofs. So the output of the circuit is going to be a proof that's the aggregation of these uh, two circuits. Okay, I generate this circuit again with 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 Plonk, and this will give us um, well a structure, and I can generate again. Um, I can do the same process that I did with the recursive one circuit. So I can generate a template. Okay, that. Um, the template that verifies this recursive to uh, circuit, and I remove the root C, uh, so this is the specific of this um, recursive to circuit, uh, the, the specifics, the constant value of this recursive to circuit, I take it outside. Okay, and the cool thing here is that the, the two um, templates that I generated, once I uh, remove the 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 the, the, this constant, this, this, this constant root, which is represents uh, which circuit is verifying. So these two templates are exactly the same. Okay? So they have the same structure. They have, they have the same degree. They have the same structure. And depending of if this root C, you uh, put uh, one constant, the constant for the recursive one, or the constant for the recursive two, uh, it will verify the recursive one or the recursive two uh, circuit, but the circuit is exactly the same. Okay? So I can use this circuit to build, actually the recursive two is gonna be a circuit that's gonna be like this, but here the, the root C um, 
So the the, the root C, I, I, I just have a, uh, um, so I can select, uh, we have a selector here that uh, um, specifies if it selects the recursive one or the recursive two. Okay? But the recursive two, I want to be the same circuit that this. So here we have a, a chicken and egg uh, problem. So the idea is that, okay, what I'm doing is, uh, it, it can be recursive one or the recursive two, I just put it outside. Okay, so the, the, the root C, is 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 the one that uh, you want to to verify. Okay, so the interesting thing here is that I have a circuit that it can verifies. Uh, it can verifies. So I have a circuit that can verifies um, um, uh, two proofs, and this proof can be either um, a recursive one, so a basic uh, batch proof or a recursive two, which is an aggregated proof, okay? And this allows me to uh, generate a tree, of, uh, a tree of proofs, so a tree of recursion proofs, so I can build, uh, so I can, and I can do, I can build this tree as, uh, as I want, so I can aggregate to, so the batch of the, uh, I can aggregate the proof for the batch uh, one and two, uh, separately I can aggregate the batch for three and four, and then uh, aggregate the resulting two proof to a single proof, and this proof is gonna is gonna prove the 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 the, the sequence, so that it's gonna prove the segment between one and fourth. Okay, and then I can take this proof and maybe aggregate it with uh, proof uh, five. Okay, and then I can take the result and aggregate it with the uh, proof that's aggregating. The, that that's aggregating the batches uh, six, seven, eight, and nine. Okay, so I can I can build in parallel, and I can build this 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 this, this proof that uh, represents a, a a full a full segment. Okay, this is the interesting thing of recursion, and in this case, an infinite recursion. That's how we how this is built. Okay, and once we have this final proof that just um, proof a full segment, then uh, next, the final step is uh, I want to verify that on chain. So how do I do that? Well, the first is I generate a, I generate a, a circuit using the same template that I used before. In this case, the root C, uh, I already, here I, I can already hard code the root C1 and the, for the recursive one and recursive two. Okay, and the, but the thing here is that this circuit, instead of using a hash of uh, using a Poseidon of the same uh, prime field, uh, the Goldilocks prime field for the Starks, the one that we are using for Starks. We are using the, um, the Poseidons of, with the BN 128. Okay, so and then so this the, the, this 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 Stark is going to be a normal Stark, but the the, the hashing is going to be one uh, the BN 128. So uh, after this circuit, I can verify this Stark, but uh, not using the Goldilocks, but using the BN128. So I generate, here I can generate a normal circuit. I can generate a normal uh, circum uh, circuit that is using, that verifies this, but is, is very optimal because it's using normal Poseidon for the BN128, okay? In this final circuit, um, I also um, hash all the public inputs to a single input uh, with SHA-256. This is done also in the, in the on-chain. So the, the idea here is to, instead of having a, a circuit with many public inputs, I have a, a circuit with one public input. This is a technique for aggregate, for reducing the number of uh, public inputs. And this is a final circum. So here I can uh, compile the circum circuit to gross 16 plonk or in our case what we are doing is uh, flonk okay, we are using flonk flonk allows us it's it's more expensive uh, it's a proving system is a plonkish it's a, it's a it's a proving system that well it's a kind of a plonk but the idea is that you can you spend more time proving in this case it takes more than two seconds uh, to generate this proof but the gas cost for verifying this final flunk is uh, less than gross 16. So it's really, a really it takes like 170k gas. So it's really, uh, it's really, it's, it's uh, really, really, really cheap to verify that, okay? So this, 
This final circuit has about 16 uh, million uh, of uh, plumb constraints. And this is the one that we verify uh, on chain. So we see that on chain, you, you can see here that it, on chain with a single uh, flung proof with a very small circuit, it's less than one kilobyte, a kilobyte and uh, I verify, I can verify a full segment of the, of the, of the roll up. And to finish this lecture, uh, I would like to mm, explain a little bit the current state uh, of the network and what, what are the challenges in the, in, in, in the near future. Right now, the, the Polygon CKBM uh, is already in mainnet as a beta since uh, March 2023. And uh, challenges, so the next steps is we need to be uh, uh, tied to, that means implementing uh, some of the pre-compiled smart contracts that are uh, missing, like Paidings, uh, Shadow 56, and Blake. We also uh, have to. We also have to work with uh, data compression. Um, right now, the limitation, the, the, big, the, the biggest bottleneck of the zk rollups, or and the rollups in general, is the data availability that's required in the layer one. So here, compressing this data is uh, an important an important thing. And with rollups, you can compress a lot, removing the signatures and using uh, information of uh, the state or the previous transactions to do a better compression. Um, EIP 4844, dunk sharding and proto dunk sharding um, are important. Implementing them and uh, adapting to them is really important. Another thing is, another interesting topic of work is that right now the, the proof is a big monolithic proof with all the state machines, okay? But this, we are wasting a lot of polynomials because sometimes we are not using all the resources. Imagine that in the catch-ups we have like many polynomials and uh, we, we can do like 2,000 catch-ups, but maybe there are some blocks that we only uh, uh, are using 500 catch-ups. So we are wasting a lot of uh, polynomials. So the idea here is to uh, split the proof in many subproofs, one for the catch-ups, one for arithmetics, and the idea is have um, a bigger proof that uh, aggregates all these subproofs, connecting them together and uh, selecting, you know, having, being able to prove different sizes for these uh, subproofs. This will also give, uh, um, you know, better, better, better performance. It will require less memory to compute this proof and uh, probably these subproofs also will be able to fit in a GPU. So we expect a lot of acceleration uh, in that front. Security, just mentioned that security is uh, an important thing. Uh, these systems are complex and, and new and security is uh, um, very important to invest in uh, auditings and checking, rechecking, re-auditing and the new things, rechecking the audit. So it's a, an important bet, okay? And the other big topic is the decentralization, decentralizing the sequencer is, or if you want, converting the replacing the sequencer with a consensus mechanism is something that's important to decentralize uh, the system. To finish, mention that all the uh, Polygon CKBN is open source and all the repos are available. Uh, they are in GPL. You can check, uh, study, uh, deploy, and use them. Uh, uh, reference and, uh, as a, uh, and for learning. So thank you very much and this is, that's all for this lecture.